If you notice what just happened, I just turned on a recording. So we're actually going to be recording audio and screen capture for today's session. So that'll mean if you ask me a question, then I'll probably repeat the question back <laughs> just so it gets on the audio uh, and then I'll answer it. Um, and if you don't want someone to hear your voice <laughs> recorded, then don't shout. Otherwise, it probably won't pick you up. <laughs> You're just talking in a normal voice. So um, this is knowledge management. Everybody in the right place? Are we good? All right. So um, today we're going to look at one specific part of ShareWell, and that's knowledge management. Um, if you've forgotten my name, it's Jordan. So just remember to stop me at any point as I'm going through. Don't wait for me to stop and ask you if you have questions because I will probably forget to do that. So just interrupt me and ask me. And uh, we're going to do the same kind of deal we did for the intro class where we'll kind of go through everything together and then we'll take a break and then we'll come back and do the activity guide. Did anyone not get the activity guide? I sent it this morning. Okay, what is your U -ed? C E B R I S T. C E B? B as in boy. R. I S T. Okay, great. Okay, so I did send it uh, probably about 7:30 or so. So I will um, email that to you on the break, and you'll be able to use the PDF. Um, so this is the afternoon session. So if you've been in other of my afternoon sessions, what I always say is this is the sleepier of the two, <laughs> generally speaking. So if I start to see some eyes dragging and stuff, I'll pause the recording and we'll do some jumping jacks or something together. So if you don't want to do that, please just stay awake <laughs> and we'll get through it uh, just sitting in our chairs. So today um, we're going to learn about all about the knowledge management feature and I'm going to cram a ton of information into you in about an hour. So we're going to look at, first of all, what the knowledge management process even is, um, how we're going to kind of take knowledge articles from uh, first creation through editing and voting and then eventual publication to the public if that's something that happens. Um, so I'm going to show you how to create a knowledge article, how to edit them, how to vote for them, and then we're also going to look at how to kind of link them to other items in the system like just basically other tickets or change records or things like that. So like I said, we're going to go through stuff together and then we're going to do our activity. That's kind of just what this is explaining. So let's kind of review first off um, what knowledge management is. So I talked about this in the intro section, but just as a reminder, when you think about knowledge in ITIL terms, it's just any kind of documentation that helps us provide services. So that includes all the kind of stuff we're used to seeing on the, the TSC's knowledge base, like how-to articles and overviews and those, those kinds of things. Uh, and it also includes project documentation. So like functional design documents or technical design documents or process maps or all those wonderful little things that we create as part of projects, those are also considered knowledge. And the point of knowledge management is just to get all this stuff in one place so that everyone across campus can use it. <coughs> everyone can see it um, and when they, their customers call in with an issue that another team has already figured out how to resolve, they'll have that knowledge right there available for them as well. Now, knowledge creation in ShareWell is designed to be um, crowdsourced. And I use that term kind of lightly. What I really mean by that is user sourced. So remember our distinction that we talked about in the intro class between customer and user. So you guys are the users. You're the ones that are going to be creating the knowledge articles. And by default, everyone has access to create knowledge articles. And once you create one, everyone has access to edit your knowledge articles. So everyone also has access, that's the third little guy there on the right with the mustache. That's evil Reggie Redbird if you, if you didn't know. Uh, everyone also has access to vote for this stuff, whether it's useful or not. So as you're going through and resolving tickets, you can indicate whether the knowledge articles helped you do that or not. Now I'm going to actually um, mute my projector here for a second. and. Um, Oh, I wish I could. Can I? Let's see if I can do this. Oh, yeah. All right. That's a w lovely sound. <laughs> um, every single team, so what I showed you there with the knowledge creation, right? User based. Every single team will have to kind of decide on their own exactly how they want to use that. 
But in addition to there being um, sort of everyone across campus participating, there's also the creation of this new team called the Knowledge Team. And the Knowledge Team is made up of people from the training team and some people from the TSC as well. And the Knowledge Team's job is really to um, control knowledge articles that are public facing. So anything that the, our customers can see, those articles will be in control of the Knowledge Team and only the Knowledge Team will be able to edit those. They're kind of the gatekeepers of that. As a knowledge team, we also have a suggestion for you all on how we think it's best to use the knowledge management system in ShareWell. And this uh, best practice is represented by an acronym UFFA. UFA. UFFA. And this stands for use it, flag it, fix it. Add it. So what does this mean? Use it, flag it, fix it, add it. Let's say you get a ticket that comes in and um, you don't know how to resolve that ticket right off the top of your head. So what you're going to do is search the knowledge base looking for a knowledge article to explain to you how to fix it, how to resolve that incident. If you find that knowledge article, you're going to use it. That's you. Easy enough. You're going to use it, that is, if it's helpful. <laughs> okay? If you find it and it's not helpful, you're going to do one of two things. Either you're going to flag it, and flag it means you vote not useful on the record, and then you write a message about why it wasn't useful. So this is not useful because it stopped working after step seven, or this has out of date addresses, or whatever. All right? That's called flagging it. The other thing you can do, and this is the better thing to do if you can, if you find the knowledge article and it's not useful and you can fix it, fix it. That's the second F there. Just edit the knowledge article. Change step 7 through 10, whatever, if you find out how to actually do that. So again, use it if you find it and it's useful. Flag it or fix it if you find it and it's not useful. And if you don't find it, add it. That's the A. Just add the knowledge article in. So you'll resolve the incident anyway, right? And once you've done that resolution, take the text from that incident record and just copy it over into a new knowledge article. And now the next person who has that incident come up has a knowledge article to look at to see how to resolve that incident. Make sense? So any questions about this process? Okay, now I'm, so again, the knowledge team, I'm not going to be standing behind you at your desk whispering UFA into your ears <laughs> every time you're resolving an incident, right? You have to kind of decide on your own. Each team will have to decide how to do that. But this is what we think is kind of best practice, and this is what I'm going to assume we're doing for the rest of training. Do you have a question? So if somebody fixes it, then they don't have to fix it. Will the old resolution still show? Or, I mean... Are you talking, so the, the question is, if someone fixes it, will the old resolution still show? Will the original... Original text? of the article? Yeah, if somebody changes your and yeah. you screw it up, now you get blamed for it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So the question is if someone goes in and edits my stuff, and now the text is different, yeah. is the <laughs> is the is the original text still going to be accessible? Yeah. And the answer is every single change that is made to a knowledge record is recorded. Okay. So it might be a little bit challenging to get that text. I'll actually show you where you'll get it. Um, and it's going to be a little bit annoying to find it. But if you needed to get that text back and kind of roll it back, you could do that. Okay. So when you're reading something that something fits, right, is it going to be written like it was written correctly the first time or you have to see, go down here and keep you know, reading the extra paragraphs? Because it would be better if it was just fixed right as if the person wrote it right the first time. Right. The question is, um, if someone fixes it, are you going to see the old yeah. data there? You're, you're not. Okay. You're not. No, you're going to have to go looking for the old information if you want to find it. The text of the article itself is going to look like it never has been changed. It'll just be like somebody changed a Microsoft Word document or something like that. This yes. Loading it up and down. What's that? Um, and what are you going to use that for besides embarrassing the person? Who wrote it? So, <laughs> so the question is, what what do I use the voting for except embarrassing the person who wrote it? Um, so there's a couple of reasons. So it's for you as a user, so that when you're searching for stuff, you're going to see how many votes each article has, and you're going to see the ones that are the most useful at the top so that you know I'm going to go there first. The other reason that we have the votes is for the knowledge team. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have sort of reports and things, and we're going to look at those that are voted most useful, 
And those are going to be potential candidates to become public-facing articles. So you only vote it up, you don't vote it down, is that right? So the, the question is, you only vote it up or down. So you would vote it down if you can't fix it. Right? So if you, if you have read the knowledge article and it's not useful to you and you can't change it, then that's when we really suggest you vote it down. And then put a comment in about why, you can't, or why it's incorrect, essentially, at that point. And I'll show you how to do all that when we get in there. Good questions. All right, so let me, um, hopefully I can pull this projector back down to where it'll stay. Yes, awesome. And I'll turn my projector back on. And we will go ahead and go into ShareWell at this point. So again, to open up ShareWell, oh, question? Oh, thank you, I do need to pull the screen down. Awesome. All right. So again, to go into ShareWell, you'll see a, a blue circle icon along your desktop shortcuts there. Just double click on that icon. And then it will ask you which environment you want to connect to. Just go ahead and click OK. Then you'll get a login screen that'll pop up. And you'll log in with your normal ULID and password. But just remember that you must put in this prefix AD I-L-S-T-U backslash in front of your ULID in order for this to work. But it's your regular password and your regular ULID. Yeah, that's loading. Everybody logged in okay? We're all getting there. Cool. All right, so um, there are two different ways to search for knowledge articles. So if you're taking my advice, right, and you get a call in or email or whatever, however the incident comes in, and you don't know how to fix it off the top of your head, you're going to start searching the knowledge base to try to figure out how to resolve it. So there are two different ways to do that. The first way is to use your quick search that we used in the intro class. So again, that's in the left, left hand side, kind of towards the upper left hand corner. You'll see the quick search field. And you'll notice that there's a drop down menu at the top of that quick search field that if you click on it, you'll see a bunch of different things you can search for. One of which, second from the bottom, is knowledge article. So go ahead and click on that. Click on that knowledge article. And then what I want you to do is search for the following. Uh, you're going to put in REG dash E. That's a Reggie. REG dash E. And then click go or hit search, whatever. This is a um, fake robot that's in this system. That's the name of the robot. It's the robotic excitement generation engine. This is the name I came up with for this. It's a, a robotic mascot. Um, and you can see a bunch of other articles that have been written by people in my other classes. How are we doing, Michelle? Oh, you got it. All right, so go ahead and search for REG-E. Now, I notice some of you um, don't have this particular view, right? So you have what's called the hyperlink view. Um, so just as a reminder, if you want to get to this more grid view, click on the view menu in the upper left corner, and the fourth option down says results in grid. So you can click on that if you'd rather view them the way I am. And so you'll notice um, in that list of search results, Towards the far right side, you'll see two columns, one that says useful and one that says not useful. And there are numbers of votes for each of those articles. So that's going to show you how many times somebody has voted for each particular one. Um, now, there are, this is not too bad. Um, there's only 12 there, so that's kind of a reasonable number. Um, in my previous classes, before my data got wiped out, I had a couple that had been voted for like 180 times. Okay, but I didn't have 180 students in my class. <laughs> the reason it had been voted for that many times is because the system does not limit you to one vote. So if you wanted to go in there and just spam click not like or not useful on something or spam click useful, the system will let you do that, but please do not. All right? We're sort of relying on you not, not to rage dislike something or fake like something. Um, we're gonna, I, I tell people to, you know, not, don't go all Chicago on me and start voting multiple times. Just vote the once for each article. Now, as these articles get edited, 
we make it to a point where all the votes don't really reflect the content of the article. Right? So maybe there's been a bunch of not useful votes, but now the article has been edited and now it's actually more useful. So at that point, you, know, you could put in a request to the training team or whatever. Um, the training team will be kind of looking for this stuff too, and we can just wipe those votes out and reset them. So this is one way to find knowledge articles. The other way, which I like better, is called the knowledge pane. So to access the knowledge pane, you're going to go back up to your view menu. Again, that's third from the left on the top left corner. And you're going to click on the third option within view that says knowledge. And you'll see another column open up on the right hand side that has knowledge at the top, right? That's the knowledge pane. Now right underneath the header where it says knowledge, we're still on the right hand side on that column, Right underneath the header, you're going to see a couple buttons there. And the far right side, there's two buttons that have magnifying glasses on them. One that's just a magnifying glass and one that's a magnifying glass in front of a square. Okay, so that's a lot big explanation to show you where two buttons are. <laughs> uh, but those are important buttons, okay? So the first one I want you to click is the one on the far right, the one that's just the magnifying glass. If you mouse over it, it says search is a general knowledge search. Click on that. And you'll notice when you click on that, there's some more checkboxes that come up here. So the, you notice actually one of them says search Google. So you can actually search uh, Google from here. Um, I think there are going to be some other additional ones added here as well. And I know there's also going to be a checkbox that's going to allow you to search just for the knowledge articles that your team has created or your team owns. So that you, can, you don't have to wade through other teams' information if you know it's not going to be there. So here again, the same thing, type in Reggie and search for uh, the same robot here, REG-E, and then click go, and you'll see the search results are going to show up in this panel now along the right hand side. So why is this better or why do I like it better? Uh, because if you click on one of these, so click on the first one there, Knowledge Article 17, you'll notice what happens is that a brand new window opens up rather than if you use the quick search. So let's say you're in an uh, incident record and you're searching for knowledge. If you use the quick search, you have to leave your incident record, look up knowledge, and then go back to your incident record. If you use the knowledge pane, you can just open up the new window, stay on your incident record, and move back and forth between those windows. So that's why I like it better. So I'm going to go full screen on my second window here. Um, now there's a bunch of stuff here. We're going to go through every single one of the fields uh, on this page. And I'm going to start with the statuses along the top. So there's four up here, internal review, published, and retired. And we're going to go briefly back to our PowerPoint to talk about those. So the first one is internal. And that just means that this article is only visible to users. So customers cannot see this when they go to the self-service portal. The only people who can see this are users who are logged into ShareWell. A lot of the documents that we create may never go past this stage. Okay? They may just be for internal use only. No one else will ever see them. However, if it is something that we think customers will find useful or that they can you know, use to help themselves, then that article could go to the review stage. And the review stage means that the article is being reviewed by that knowledge team I mentioned earlier. And at that point, the knowledge team is really going to be reviewing it for style kinds of things um, and readability, not so much um, you know, checking the content. So it's, it's not like the knowledge team is going to go through and go through every single step and make sure it's correct. If it gets to this point, we're kind of assuming the content is correct. Okay? And we're just kind of reviewing for readability. There are two ways that it could get to the review stage. You could submit it for review. You could nominate it for review. Or, like I mentioned earlier, the knowledge team will actually be looking through the useful, not useful votes. And those that have the most votes, they'll kind of be considering for you know, public consumption. Once it goes to the review stage, it'll go to publish stage, and that means everyone can see it. Right? So they log into the portal, they can use it. And then finally, once the information is no longer accurate, uh, it'll go to the retired stage where you know, it's basically just archived and not visible by default. So it could go directly from internal to retired, right? Just skip the steps in between. Depends if it's public or not. Okay. So those are the statuses along the top. So we can see this one's in the internal status. 
Um, if you look towards the left hand side, you'll see it also says internal, kind of in the top uh, header here. And right underneath that, you'll see a white link that says submit for review. So that's how you would actually submit it for review, using that link. If you continue to follow it down, you can see who can view this and who can edit it, IT staff in both cases. Who owns this, so this is owned by the HE training team and me in particular. And then right underneath that, there are your voting buttons. So you've got useful, not useful. I, I may have misspoken earlier, but just to emphasize, this is not like, don't like. Okay, this is useful or not useful. <laughs> There's a <laughs> distinction there, all right? And again, this will let you click it as many times as you want, but you know, please just do it the once. Now, if you're clicking not useful, remember I told you that I want you to add a note to be more specific about how, why it wasn't useful? To do that, you're going to use the journal notes tab down here in the bottom section. So all these tabs along here, this whole section is called the arrangement. I don't know why it's called the arrangement, but it is. That's the share well term for it. So if I were to say, look at your arrangement, that's what I'm talking about. And there's the second tab from the left there is journal notes. So click on that. And then you'll see in the journal notes tab, there's a button on the left hand side that says new journal dash note. So just click on that. And a text field will open up that says details. And this is where you'll type in your specific you know, flag about why this wasn't useful. Right? Wasn't useful past step eight or whatever. This is, by the way, you'll see this journal notes tab on incident and service request records, change records, all kinds of things. Um, it works the same way. Question? Does the original person get notified if somebody adds something to it? Because they might not have done it right. Yeah, so the question is, um, does the original person get notified if a journal note is added here? No. Not by default. They will not get an email notification that it's been changed. All right, so um, again, that now will be, note will be added there. I'm going to move my arrangement down so we can see more of what's in the center section now. Um, and I want to skip down to these check boxes underneath the content pane. You'll see along the left hand side underneath content, limit viewing to owning team and limit editing to owning team. So remember what I said is by default, anytime you create an article, everyone can see it and everyone can edit it. This is how you can restrict that if you need to. So if you click on limit viewing to owning team, it means nobody can see it except whoever owns it. And you can see again the owning team along the left hand side. If you click on limit editing to owning team, everyone can see it, but only the owning team can edit it. So if you find situations, if you're finding that people keep changing your stuff <laughs> and it's, you, know, you don't want them to do that anymore, you can restrict that via, via these checkboxes. There's also a checkbox if you kind of look to the right, right underneath the content pane still, that says visible in customer portal. Uh, there's still some discussion about whether this is even useful or not, um, but it's not really going to be useful to anyone who's not on the knowledge team. You can check this box all you want, but unless that status says published, it's not actually visible in the customer portal. All right, so the rest of these we're going to talk about, but we're going to do it as if we were creating a brand new one. So I want you to click the cancel button in the bottom right corner. So again, you're going to create a new knowledge article whenever you discover that there's not one that exists for the incident that you just resolved. So to create a new one, you're going to look up in the left hand corner right in your toolbar. You've got your back button, home, forward, all that kind of stuff. And then if you keep going to the right, you'll see new and there'll be a little blue puzzle piece there. So to create one, you can either click on that button or you can click the drop down menu there and you'll see the other things you could create that are new. Um, so if you're not looking at a knowledge article, you have to click the drop down and then select new knowledge article. All right, so create a new one for me, open a new record. And I hit the wrong key, new knowledge article. There we go. And I'm actually gonna uh, minimize my panes to the left and right so that we can see mine better. I'm going to click auto hide. And you have a blank record, same as they had earlier, but now we've got a bunch of fields in red. Anything in red is required. You've got to fill it out. So you're going to start with a title, and this just needs to be descriptive enough that it'll explain what the article is when you're scanning through a list of search results. Originally, they had also said, you know, put your team name at the front, but we're not going to do that. Okay, we're just going to put the title. So I'm going to do one about email. So I'm going to put something like fixing 
uh, Outlook error number eight six seven five three oh nine. Okay. You can put whatever title you want. Doesn't matter. Next, you're going to put in keywords. So the keywords field is for you to put in terms that you think people will search for that do not appear in your title or your content pane. Okay, because it's automatically going to search those anyway. So this would be like alternate things you think people might be looking for. So I have fixing Outlook error. I might put in like exchange in the content pane or in the keywords, excuse me, or Office 365, whatever, kind of alternate terms for whatever you're creating there. After the keywords, you can put in the actual content of your knowledge article. So, you know, you can just start typing here. And you'll notice as you type, the text is small and plain text, right? Kind of little. But there's a way to actually edit this, right? Use a rich text editor. And to do that, you're going to click on this. Go ahead and click on this button for me along the left-hand side. It looks like a little magnifying glass right to the left, left corner of the content pane. Click on that little button, and you'll see a new window will pop open that's called the Rich Text Zoom window. And this will allow you to actually make more advanced changes. So I can highlight this. And, you know, right above my text, I see I can change the font. So I want to change it to uh, Felix t Titling, I guess. I don't know what that is. Okay, and I can make it really large. Um, then, of course, if you just follow it along to the right, that toolbar, you'll see bold, italicize, underline. Uh, what else we got in there? You know, alignment left, center right, justified, bold list, number lists, indent changes, all kinds of stuff like that. Right above that, you'll also see um, things like cut, copy, paste, undo, redo, those sorts of normal text editing things. And then if you would for me, go ahead and click on the insert menu. That's the middle menu there, the fourth one, along the top. And you'll see other things you can put in. So you can put in pictures here. So you want to put screenshots. You can put hyperlinks in, tables, special characters. You could put bookmarks in if you really wanted to bookmark, <laughs> bookmark your page, things like that. So all that stuff there um, to help you kind of make a more useful knowledge article. So once you've got whatever changes you want to make, just click OK. And you'll see all those stylings that you chose will show up in the content pane. All right, so we talked about these checkboxes already, so let's skip on down to classifications. So you've got a couple of different uh, drop-down menus highlighted in red here. So the first one is service. Click on the service drop-down menu, and you'll see about 10 or so different services. This refers back to that service catalog that we talked about in the intro class. So that service catalog has that giant list of every service we offer to our customers. And so here in this knowledge article, what you're doing is specifying which of those services in the service catalog this knowledge article refers to. Um, so mine's about email, so I'm going to choose email and calendaring. Now it might take you a little while to figure out which one to pick for whatever you're doing, um, but that's, you know, there's actually knowledge articles in the live environment right now explaining to you what all these services are <laughs> and when you should choose which one. So you can review those. Um, and of course, if you get it wrong, you can always just change it. It's not like it's locked in stone. Once you choose a service, you now have to specify further within that service what the category is. And so I'm going to choose email as my category. So the category, of course, will change based on what service you pick. And then the last required field here is the article type. So there's four different kinds of articles that you can create in knowledge management. How-tos are probably the ones you're most familiar with, right? Those step-by-step -step instructions on how to do something. An overview is also, you may have seen those in the knowledge base, that usually includes kind of introductory or overarching information about a particular thing. A design document is usually going to be related to a project or a change. So it'll be um, you know, a functional design document, a technical design document, a process map, something like that. And then a technical document is oftentimes something that the vendor delivers to us, some technical specifications about something. Or if you wrote an article and it's you know, just for programmers or system admins and it's never going to see public use and it's just for a technical audience, you can choose technical document as well. And again, if you pick the wrong one, you just change it. So I'm going to pick how to. All right? And at this point, I'm actually done if I wanted to be with my knowledge article. So the rest of this stuff is just kind of supplementary information.
And the first one is the primary CI field. So again, going back to our intro class, I talked about the CMDB, the big giant inventory of stuff. Okay. Within the CMDB, we have things that are called configuration items or CIs, and that's just the ITIL word for thing. Okay. So a monitor is a CI, an application is a CI, a server is a CI, etc. So when you create a knowledge article, you can actually specify what CI this article is about. So oftentimes this will be something really broad, what we call a system CI like Microsoft Outlook or you know, Campus Solutions or something like that. It'll be a giant big thing. But it could be something really specific too if you wanted it to be. So it could be, you know, if you're writing about a particular kind of server, you could link that server in the primary CI field. So to, to do that, you're going to click on what's called the selector button. And so you'll notice there's two buttons on the right hand side of the primary CI field. The only one that's active is called the selector button. And if anybody can figure out what this icon is, <laughs> I would really appreciate it. I think it's like binoculars and a hand or something, but I've looked at this for like 20 minutes, probably like 25 or 35 or 45 minutes and I can't figure out what it is because it's just too small. But it's called the selector button. <laughs> um, and so if you click it, you'll see a new window open up that allow you to search for the configuration item that you want to link. And the very first column there is going to say uh, friendly name. And that's just kind of the name of the CI and it's not like a big giant serial number or whatever. And so if you're writing about Campus Solutions, you could you know, look through there and find Campus Solutions. You could find Microsoft Outlook. You could find server number whatever if you're writing it about that. Uh, and I don't know if there's anything that I really, I don't think there's Microsoft Outlook in here right now. These are all sort of test things. Um, so I'm just going to pick one at random. ReggieNet training. Okay. And whatever one you pick, you'll notice that the friendly name will show up here in the primary CI field. So if you know the friendly name, you can just type it in. Right? So if you're doing like 12 articles about Outlook, you can just type in Outlook every time. Uh, if you type it in incorrectly, the search window will just open up for you automatically anyway. So you know, either way works. So if you're working on a unique piece of equipment, this mm -hmm. is where you could put articles, like how to maintain that piece of equipment. Yeah, the question is if you're working on a unique piece of equipment, could you use this to write articles about maintaining that piece of equipment? And the answer is absolutely yes. And that's, that's one of the intended uses of this. So you would put that specific piece of equipment here in the primary CI field. And if there was multiple ones, there's a way to add them all as well that I'll show you in a second. So if you had, um, if you were writing an article about how to fix a certain kind of server and you had five of those servers, you could link them all. Um, but you're only able to do one of them here and then I'll show you where to do the other ones. So, yeah. Question? What do you do if you're, the thing you're using is a flip? So the question is, what do you do if the thing that you're using isn't listed? You leave it blank. <laughs> it's not a required field. So if it's not in the system yet, you can just leave it blank and move on. Um, and a lot of the stuff won't be necessarily yet because we're doing the CMDB in three phases. So this first phase, when it first goes live, the only stuff that's going to be in here are, are what are called infrastructure CIs. And that's usually going to be a server or a network jack, an enclosure, all that kind of stuff that supports the services we offer. Um, but there will be big things too like Microsoft Outlook and Campus Solutions and those kind of big system or software CIs will be in there too. So for the most part a lot of the stuff you'll probably want to do is going to be there initially. But if it's not, you can, you know, it might be in by March. Okay. Okay. So that's the primary CI field. Okay, then We've got, we talked about some of the stuff along the left here already. So I want to talk to you then about the rest of these tabs along the bottom. So again, I'm going to open my arrangement up. Now to do this, there's a couple ways you can actually expand this out if you need more room in your arrangement. Right? So you can mouse over in between the two sections and click and drag it up. Uh, or you can actually, and you should do this, go ahead and double click on one of the, the column headers, or the, excuse me, the tab headers. And you'll see it'll just pop open for you. And you can double click it again to pop it back down. So I find that easier to do than moving my mouse in the right spot and clicking and dragging. But either one works. Alright, so we got a ton of tabs here. I'm going to go over all of them. And you're going to get sick of me going over them, but that's, that's just how it's going to work today. <laughs> um, so the first one here 
is uh, internal escalation information. This tab was created specifically for the Technology Support Center. And the idea here is the TSC often will look at knowledge articles when they're trying to resolve incidents. And they sometimes need to know, OK, which team do I escalate this ticket to um, if I can't resolve it myself? And so this is going to show them what team supports the application that this knowledge article is about. That makes sense. So when they're looking at this in the process of resolving a ticket, they'll know exactly which team to send it to. Journal notes we talked about. That's the one to the right there. And of course, this is just you know, free form text. So you can use this, like I said, to flag articles. You can also just use it to add commentary or comments or whatever if you wanted to. It's basically just like a post-it note on the record. The next one there is tasks. So go ahead and click on the tasks tab. And then I want you to click on the new task button, which is in the upper left corner of the task tab. And you'll see a big record open up here for a new task that you're creating. And a task, to remind you from the intro class, is just something that you are assigning to another team because you need help. So in this case, it would be, I want help with this knowledge article. Now this will work the same way with incidents and service requests. You can create tasks for those. And in that case, it would be, I need help with this incident or this service request. But in this case, it's, I need help with this knowledge article. And so to assign that task, you're going to click on this team drop-down menu, and then pick the team that you want to assign it to. So you can pick whatever you want. I'm going to pick uh, the training team. And then if you click on the assignee drop-down menu, you can actually pick a specific person on that team to assign it to. Uh, I generally tell people best practice is just assign it to the team and let them decide. Unless you're on the phone with that person and they're like, hey, assign it to me. <laughs> okay? And then, of course, use your judgment there and assign it to them. But otherwise, you know, let the team decide who does what. So I'm going to leave that blank. Um, then you'll just put in a title, right? So uh, please check um, steps 8 through 19. Okay? And then you can describe it more. You know, I don't have the access to check these. Right, whatever you have there. So once you've given this a title and described what you want the team or the person to do, then after you save this knowledge article, the whole thing, the whole record, then that task will go to that team. So it'll show up in their dashboard. Um, they can then assign it out to individual team members if they need to do that. Um, once they get it, they will acknowledge it. They'll click on this link along the left that says acknowledge, which by the way, this is what you'll do if you get a task assigned to you. Okay? You'll acknowledge it by clicking this link on the left. Then you'll do the task, and then you'll click this completed link and enter in the completion details underneath the description to describe what it is you did. If they assigned it to your team and they shouldn't have, click on this misassigned link right underneath completed, and then it'll go back to them. So this, these tasks, you can assign multiple of these. Okay? And to do that, um, you just can keep continue to hit the new task button for as many times as you want. If you do have multiple ones and you want to see kind of a summary of all of them, click on this View button in the um, Task Toolbar along the right-hand side. Go ahead and click on that. And you'll see a more of a grid view there. And so if you have multiple ones, they'll show up in the different rows. And you can look at the statuses all at once. But again, this won't do anything until you save the whole record. So the next tab is revision history. So if you click on revision history, the point of this tab is to give you a place to manually indicate what changes you made to an article. So I told you that it automatically tracks every change, and it does that. But that automatic tracker is a little bit clunky and hard to understand at times. And so this was created basically to give you a way to summarize or explain um, more clearly what it is you did when you changed an article. So it's a good idea to do this, right? So if you edit an article, you're going to want to add something to the revision history, but you can't do it from the tab. You actually have to click on a link in the main content pane. So underneath the voting buttons, you'll see a section that says, I want to. And then the third uh, link in that section is update the revision history. Click on that link. And a little prompt window will open up, and you know, this is where you describe what you did. 
So when you type that in, just click OK, and it'll show up there in that tab. But you will have to click on the link in the main section to do that. question is, is it required if you have to put something there? It's not required by the system. Yeah, so you can you could change things and save it, and it wouldn't warn you to update the revision history. All right, so that's revision history. Um, the one, the automatic auditing, uh, that's called journal history, okay? And that's sort of towards the right, second from the right. You'll see a, a tab that says journal history. You can click on that tab. And there's nothing here now, of course, because this is a brand new article. But once um, edits start being made, those changes will show up here. And the reason it's kind of clunky is that it'll say something like, like let's say you change two words in an article. It'll say, the following text has been changed. It'll have the entire text of the article. And then it'll say, two, and then the entire text of the new article. So you'd have to manually scan both of those to find the two words <laughs> that were changed if you wanted to use that to figure out exactly what was changed. That's why the manual thing exists. But that's also why your original text is always recoverable, because the full text is always going to be there, um, regardless of what happens. All right, so that's journal history. The last five tabs in here are all pretty similar. And they're all designed to link this knowledge article to other records in the system. So the first one I want you to click on is related articles. Right? That's right to the right of revision history. This tab allows you to link this knowledge article to other articles. Okay? So if this was like an overview article, you could, you know, if this was an overview of Outlook, you could link it to all the different Outlook articles, right? Configuring Outlook calendar, um, whatever. And you know, setting an away message all the different kind of related things. And to do that, you're going to click on this leftmost button. looks like a little paper clip with a green plus sign. If you mouse over to it says, add an existing knowledge article, click on that for me. And you'll see a new search window open up that will allow you to search for the related article. So you can pick whatever you want there. Um, I don't know. It doesn't really matter which one here. I'm going to pick this other one. Okay, and it'll show up in, the, in that tab below. To remove this, if you want to get rid of it, just make sure it's selected. So click on it. And then you'll notice there's a new button that's activated to the right of the link that says Unlink. And it's a paper clip with a little X. So you just click on that paper clip. And it'll say, are you sure you want to unlink this? Click Yes. And it's gone. That functionality is going to be exactly the same on every tab I'm going to show you. It's just going to be linking different things. So if you click on other related services, now we already put in one service originally when we did our classification, right? I, I selected email and calendaring as the service that this referred to. But if this referred to more than one, you can enter those additional ones here. So again, click on that um, paperclip button and you'll see those 10 or so other services. And so in this case, you know, this is about Outlook, so it's also about applications. So I'm going to choose applications as my other service. The next one is incidents. So this allows you to link this knowledge article to incidents that have been resolved by this knowledge article. And it works the same way. Click the paperclip, search for the incident that you're going to link to, and then you know, just double click it to show up. So it's a really good idea to do this every time you use this knowledge article to resolve an incident. Okay? Link the incident that you used it for. So that the next time somebody comes to this article, they can see how many incidents it actually has already fixed. Next one is change requests. So this will be used primarily if your article type is like a design document. Because again, most of the time those design documents are related to projects, which are changes in the system. So you would add a change here. Like if this was a functional design document that you were putting into the system, you could then link the change that that design document was related to. And then the last one here, right to the right of change requests, is configuration items. So if you click on that one, you'll see we already have one here. This is the one that you selected as your primary CI. And this is where, again, you can add additional ones. So this is what I mentioned earlier, right? If you had six servers of one type, you could put one of them as the primary CI and then put the other five down here 
as the other CIs that are related to this article. Follow along with that. This stuff here that I'm showing you, you're going to see something super similar when we get to incidents and service requests. You're going to see something really similar when we get to changes. All the kind of stuff that I just showed you linking different records works basically the same way no matter which record you're looking at. So the last thing I'm going to show you and then we'll take our break. So bear with me for just a few more minutes um, is how to actually link a knowledge article to an incident from the incident. So oh, I had a question. Yes. So if, is everything that we've done so far, is that automatically saved or do we have to actively save this article? So the question was, is what we've done so far automatically saved? It is not automatically saved. So the save button is in the, uh, you know, the top toolbar there, right above the article. And it will warn you when you try to leave it without saving. It won't let you do that unless you confirm you don't want to save it. Um, but it's, does, it doesn't auto save as you're going through. Now there, there are a couple exceptions to that depending on different things that you do. <laughs> um, so you know, if you make attachments whatever, but it's not really, generally speaking, just assume it's not saved unless you've clicked the button. So again, we, I've just showed you how to link this knowledge article to an incident from the knowledge article, right, using this incidents tab. Now we're going to go the reverse. We're going to look at how to link it from the incident record because that's what frequently a lot of you are going to be doing. So go ahead and go back to your uh, home, right, click on your home button. And you'll notice as I do that, it asks me if I want to save these changes. And I'm going to say no. So you don't need to save your changes for what you just created if you don't want. So I'm going to go back to my default dashboard here. And then what I want you to do is um, double click on the 10, the number 10 that is to the right of incidents along the left hand side there. So double click on that 10 to open up every single incident in the system. And then I want you to um, Let's see which one of these is going to work. Let's try the fourth one down, 1029. Nope. Just kidding. 1028. Try the one below it. That'll work. Okay. For whatever reason, we're getting error messages uh, for some of these. So if you didn't open up this exact one, it's not a big deal. You can open up whichever one works for you. So now, um, right, so let's say this is your incident record. And this comes in from a customer, and so the first thing you're going to do is search the knowledge base to figure out if the article is in there or not. So again, what I, the, the method that I would suggest is using the knowledge pane. Okay? And the knowledge pane, I minimize mine, so the button is still over here on the right-hand side. So I'm going to go over here and click the button, and then I'm going to uh, lock it in place by clicking on the, this little thumbtack in the upper right corner. Uh, if it's gone away completely, it, remember you can get it by going up to your view menu and then choosing knowledge. So, remember those two buttons that I spent like 30 seconds explaining to you what they were? <laughs> those little magnifying glass ones? I want you to click on the other one, the one that has the magnifying glass in front of the square. If you mouse over that one, it says search is, let's see, specific to record type or something like that. Search is based on current record type. So when you click that button, You'll notice that there's now a new section in your search results set that says open incidents. So now you can actually search for incidents via the knowledge pane along with knowledge articles. And you're searching for incidents because you're looking at an incident record right now. So if you were looking at a change, you'd be searching changes, etc. So go ahead and leave REGE in there, okay, REG-E, and then click go. Okay, so you'll see the incidents that are relevant pop open, then you'll see the knowledge articles. Now you're going to open this up, right? Open up this first one for me, Knowledge Article 17. Because you're going to want to look at this one to see if you can use this to solve your incident. Right, so you open it up, you're going to review it, and you're going to say, yep, looks good, this is what I'm going to use. Notice in the bottom right hand corner, you're going to see a button that says Use Solution. Click on that button. And what happens now is two things. First of all, the knowledge article is now along the top, right? And there's a little attachment bar that showed up, and the knowledge article is linked there. The other thing that happens is that the content of that knowledge article is automatically put into the resolution field for the incident. So again, down in your arrangement, 
for this incident record, the fifth tab from the left, you'll see something that says not resolution, okay, a little green check mark. Click on that and you'll see the first thing in there is the resolution field and it has the text of the knowledge article that you just linked. Now this text, it's important to know, is going to go in the email that gets automatically sent to the customers when this incident is resolved. So if this text is not something you want the customer to see, if this is like an internal article or something that we don't want anyone to see, then make sure you cut this text out, right? Put it in the technical resolution field because technical resolution is just internal. That's the difference between these two. Technical resolution is internally, how do we fix it? Resolution is what we're gonna communicate to the customer in the email. Okay? So again, in order to do this, you must have the incident record open. You must open your knowledge pane. You must click on that one button <laughs> that has the magnifying glass in front of the square. And then you have to open the knowledge article and click use solution or you can actually just right click on the link and you'll notice in the right click menu the first option says use solution. It's the same thing. Okay, any questions on that? Yes? To edit it, um, you would just have to do it so the way you normally would, right? So you can select um, and cut. And oh, it doesn't look like it's letting me do that right now. It's not supposed to be locked. That might be a bug. When I went in here, I got a message saying that it was locked by... Oh, SMS. there you go. Sorry. So that's right. So that's why. So if you look at the top, uh, right above the attachment bar, you'll see locked by and then it'll say the, the ULID of. So you should be able to just cut it the way you normally would with you know, keyboard shortcuts and stuff. Um, but only one person at a time can you know, edit a record, right? So that's gonna prevent conflicting changes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's whatever locked, it's now locked by me. Um, so now I can get rid of it and paste it in. Okay. You'll notice also here, there's the same, you guys remember that, um, that rich text zoom button? Same thing here along the right hand side, rich text zoom. Anytime you see that next to a text field, that's what that is. So yeah, so some people have suggested putting it in the technical resolution box to begin with. So what should you do if that's a suggestion of yours? Do you remember from the intro class? Make a suggestion. Right, but how? Do you remember where they go? <laughs> no. It's right here on the screen. <laughs> it's actually it's actually covered up right now, but um, provide feedback right down here in the bottom left corner. I've actually communicated that to Carla already, but for things like that, Right? That's what that link is for. Use it. Tell us what needs to be better. Because <laughs> we really, th that's, that's the only way that it actually improves, right? Is if you guys tell us how to make it better. I say us like I'm going to be here. But, I, yeah. <laughs> I always say us you know, as the representative of the project team. Like, please give me the break. All right, so let's take the break. Um, so you can take 10 minutes. Um, you can come back when that clock says. Uh, okay. Um, and then we, uh, you can get started on your activity. So I'm going to pause this. Okay, so we're just going to do some reminders here to close out. So just remember that when you create a new knowledge article, um, you're going to want to do that pretty much every time that you solve an incident. Uh, that the knowledge article doesn't exist. Create that new knowledge article so that we can spread that knowledge kind of across campus. Remember that when uh, you use a knowledge article, vote for it, right? Indicate whether it was useful or not useful to you. Uh, remember that only published articles are visible to customers, so check that status to, you know, so that you know where exactly and who exactly can see the article. And then finally, remember that all those tabs along there down the bottom, 
are going to enable you to link that knowledge article to other kinds of records. So this is our AT training email. If you have any questions, you can always get in touch with us here. And then we'll, we'll close this recording. <laughs>